Um, again, just to remind everyone that if you want to go back and watch any of the lessons, now that we're back online, at least this week, I am putting everything that's new on, um, on YouTube. So you can feel free to go rewatch the, uh, the lessons. All right, so today's um, lesson is on stems. We've already looked at the um, specialized plant cells and plant tissues. The plant cells are parenchyma, which is the uh, very thin walled, flexible, um, very large central vacuole plant cells that are in areas where growth is still occurring. It participates in storage and metabolism. You have cholenchyma cells, which have slightly thicker cell walls. They're irregular in shape and they are grouped in strands. So they are in columns basically that help to support the plant in areas that are lengthening. And then if you have a sclerenchyma, which are in parts of the plant that are no longer growing, they are dead at maturity. They have the thickest cell walls. So this is going to be in any part of the plant where hardness is an advantage. And then of course you have the plant tissues, which are the uh, dermal tissue, ground tissue, and vascular tissue. Vascular tissue, we looked at both xylem and phloem. Then we studied the structure of roots, understanding that for gymnosperms and dicots, they go through secondary growth, which is a growth in width. So when you have secondary growth, the vascular tissue has to be organized um, so that you can place the new xylem and phloem uh, in an organized manner in the root or in today, what I'm going to describe is the stem. So stems uh, can evolve into different types to show adaptations to their environment. To show you a few examples, we have strawberry stems, which are actually called runners because they grow along the soil surface because they're a plant that grows uh, close to the ground. They're almost kind of like a vine type of plant, but they don't climb. They're not a climbing plant. They just run along the ground. Um, the potato tuber, the actual potato, the actual potato, oops, black doesn't help. The actual potato is part of the stem that's modified for storing energy. Cactuses obviously have a very thick, uh, fleshy stem that's there to store water. For this particular cactus, when it rains, it will fill up with water and all of these uh, indentations will be flushed out. So it will be a much bigger, thicker cactus that's uh, full of water. Also, because the leaves of a cactus have been modified into spines or spikes that are made of sclerenchyma cells, by the way, because their hardness is an advantage there. Um, the leaves of the cactus can no longer perform the function of photosynthesis. So in that respect, the stem of the cactus has become uh, green to carry out the process of photosynthesis for the leaves. We also have um, the black locust and honey locusts. They have very sharp thorns to protect them from animals, which if you look at herbivores, it's still a predator-prey relationship. It's just we don't tend to think of vegetables as being prey, um, but plants can also develop physical as well as chemical defenses against predation. Um, nicotine is a great example for the tobacco plant. Um, the tobacco plant didn't develop nicotine because it's addictive to humans when we smoke cigarettes. Uh, it's because it's an insecticide and the type of animal that preys on tobacco plants are insects. So it produces this secondary chemical compound that's poisonous to insects, so they won't eat it. Um, we also have a lot of medicines that have been developed from secondary compounds from plants, uh, morphine, opium, lots of drugs. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of these secondary compounds that plants produce as a defense as well. Um, but this is an example of a physical defense. Now, the structures inside a stem are similar to the roots, but they are more complex. So stems, as I said, uh, was it like a couple weeks ago now, three weeks ago, I don't know. Um, length, growing in length occurs only at the tip 
in what's called the apical meristem. The apical meristems are going to make new primary tissues. So all of the primary uh, dermal tissue, ground tissue, the xylem and phloem, is going to occur at the tips. And stems like roots can also grow in circumference or width through their lateral meristems. But the surface, like the outer uh, structure of stems have a slightly different structure or um, organization that roots don't have. First of all, I should have put that in bold because that's a vocab word. Stems are divided into segments called internodes. Each end of the internode is called a node. So here I've got a lilac uh, branch. Each part where you see leaves coming out, that is a node. And so from node to node is an internode. You don't see that in roots, okay? So the first big difference um, is that the either branches or leaves on a stem can only occur at the node as compared to a root where a lateral root can grow from anywhere within the pericycle. Remember the pericycle is that thin layer. Um, I think it's just around the vascular tissue or the cortex, I can't remember. Uh, somewhere in the internal structure in the ground in the ground tissue system, you have the pericycle and lateral roots grow from there, but it's kind of random wherever they decide to start um, developing. Lateral shoots, remember shoot is the same as stem, lateral shoots only grow at specific areas called the node. And you can see that on any plant. The nice thing about um, this chapter, when you're talking about the physical structure of a plant, you can just go outside and look. So at the point of attachment of each leaf, we call that a lateral bud. Now a bud is capable of developing into a new shoot. It could also become a flower. So each of these, this is the apical bud because it's at the top. These are all lateral buds. And it turns out, um, I'm growing basil downstairs, Italian basil, um, that I just cut the apical meristem on, I think I've got four individual plants that are growing. I've got three that are kind of bunched together and then one that's by itself. The one that's by itself is the tallest. And what I've just done is I've cut the apical meristem because once you do that, you actually stimulate the lateral, um, the lateral buds to grow. So the, bu uh, the bush, the plant should become bushier. It should be growing out from the sides more. So I'm waiting to see how that happens or how that develops. Uh, so buds, buds contain uh, apical meristem and they're protected by specialized leaves called bud scales. Now this is the bud of a flower. So that's the flower petals inside. Um, and if you happen to be outside when something is blooming or you see a flower bud, pay, pay, pay special attention to these leaves here that are there, there's three of them here, to protect the bud before it opens. Okay, those are called bud scales. Again, here's three different uh, apical buds and you can see the bud scales. So it's just these outer, outer leaves right there that protect the not quite ready to come out bud. So as I said, the tip of the stem has the terminal bud. Terminal just means the end, right? So your apical meristem is up in here. As long as this is intact, then your plant will keep growing in length. And there's, oh, I'm not franken. There's something called apical dominance, which basically just means as long as the terminal bud is intact and it's not cut, it actually prevents the lateral buds from growing. So like I said, it will keep growing taller, but you won't get more um, lateral shoots. So if you want your uh, plant to become fatter and bushier, you need to cut that off, just the tip. As soon as you cut the tip off, then apical dominance no longer applies and your lateral buds start to grow.
Okay, that doesn't really matter. Now, another difference with um, roots and stems, the root tip has a permanent protective layer called the root cap because the roots are constantly pushing their way down through the soil. You want to protect the cells in the apical meristem. So you've got that root cap, which protects the apical meristem and um, the root cap uh, releases a kind of lubricant to help it get through the soil. But the apical meristem in the stem is only protected by bud scales when the stem isn't growing. When the stem starts growing and the apical meristem, the, the bud keeps growing, then the bud scales fall off and it's no longer protected. So it's not permanent. Surface bud forms, sorry, I gotta let people in here. The surface bud forms close to the stem tip with one or more buds at each node, but lateral roots originate further back from the root tip. So basically that just means that when you've got the root tip here, lateral roots only really start growing like here, they don't go all the way to the tip. But for the stem, you have buds that can start growing all the way up to the tip like that. They generally alternate like that. So just some subtle differences between um, lateral shoots and lateral roots. So lateral roots, again, form deep inside the root at no particular location, as long as it's within the paracycle, right? But it doesn't matter, like, if you're looking, if you look, oops, if you're looking at a cross section of a root, let's say the paracycle is here, it grows from here, but it doesn't really matter from which point, you know what I mean? But for, um, excuse me, for stems, they have to grow at the nodes. They can't just grow from anywhere along the stem. All right, so here we've got a monocot. This is a monocot. This is gymnosperm and some dicots. Oops, I can spell. Now, the first thing that you might notice is that you've got this nice little ring of vascular tissue, very similar to what you had um, in roots, except in roots, it formed kind of a cross. It's kind of like that, where you had xylem in the middle and you have these little, oops, blue on blue is not a good idea. You have little pockets of phloem here, kind of like that. In stems, of course, gymnosperms, they can be huge, gigantic trees that are like several meters in diameter. Um, so the vascular tissue uh, in gymnosperms is arranged in a ring. And we're gonna come to that when we start talking about wood as well. Primary growth in stems is the same as in the roots. It, comes from the apical meristem from, to form dermal, ground, and vascular tissues. It works exactly the same way. Here in the monocot cross-section, you can see vascular bundles are just kind of randomly placed throughout the stem, not arranged in a nice ring like this, where you've got phloem towards the, sorry, xylem towards the inside, phloem towards the outside. Phloem is gonna become part of the bark. And then this nice little strip that you see in the middle, that's your vascular cambium, that light blue in between uh, the xylem and phloem. But again, I'll talk more about that uh, as I go through the section. So monocots, the vascular bundles, you, can, you can't see it behind, it says vascular bundles. So these are the xylem and phloem. They're just scattered throughout because monocots do not go through secondary growth. So you don't have to worry about, oh, there's phloem. Like if I use, what did I use? Black and so of xylem, here's xylem, 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 xylem. And I use purple, that's purple here. This is all phloem around the outside. So you see how it's all organized, like phloem all around the outside and the vascular cambium in the middle here. Xylem on the inside, but here, if I've got xylem here, xylem here, xylem here, it's just kind of random and then flow them on the other side, doesn't really make sense. So that if you were to have secondary growth, it wouldn't make sense because you'd have xylem and phloem just randomly appearing in the middle of the stem. So because monocots don't go through secondary growth, 
the vascular bundles can be scattered throughout the stem of a monocot. Dermal tissue in the stem is represented by the epidermis, the outer layer of the stem. The main function of the epidermis, just like the epidermis in any living organism, is number one, protection. Two, reducing water loss because plants are, well, most uh, plants are terrestrial, but also to allow for gas exchange. So here's another dicot monocot side by side. In gymnosperms and dicot stems, the ground tissue forms a cortex and a pith, which you can see here in yellow. So you've got the cortex. The pith is this whole middle section here. Doesn't really do anything. Um, here you've got a ray of ground tissue connecting the pith to the cortex. Cortex looks like it's just outside of the vascular tissue. And then here the ground tissue is just everything that's in between your vascular bundles that are here in, in purple. So according to the key, the blue areas are your dermal tissue. So you see the endodermis here, sorry, epidermis, epidermis, vascular tissue in purple. These are the vascular bundles. It's just like two little tubes, but you can see here it's much more organized, phloem and xylem. Just like in the root, the cortex lies just inside the epidermis. So the epidermis again around the outside. The next layer in is the cortex. Then you've got the vascular tissue. Then you've got the pith. For monocots, you have endodermis. And then you've got ground tissue with vascular bundles just scattered throughout the ground tissue. Much simpler uh, organization. Now the cortex usually contains flexible calenchyma cells. Again, calenchyma cells, because we are in the stem and the stem is going to be the major support for the plant. My lovely, lovely drawings, whatever, you get what I mean. So most of the support for the plant occurs in the stem. So you're gonna to want to have those nice calenchyma cells arranged in columns. The pith, as I said, is located in the center of the stem for dicots. The ground tissue of monocot stems is not usually separated into pith and cortex because you have that ground tissue that's just scattered throughout all of it. So you don't really see a distinction, not even really, you don't at all see a distinction between the pith and the cortex, which is part of the ground tissue. Pith and cortex, ground tissue. It is separate and distinguishable in a dicot, they are indistinguishable in a monocot. Now, vascular tissue is formed near the apical meristem and it happens in bundles. So we call them vascular bundles. These are long strands. They're embedded in the cortex. Again, we have the outer layer here is the epidermis, it's just that very outer layer. And this part right here, from here to here, that's the cortex. And then the pith in the middle. Again, xylem is on the inside, phloem on the outside. If you remember phloem is part of bark, and you remember barks on the outside of the tree, that will help. I've said that before, we don't have secondary growth. All right, da, 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 da. explain that already. All right, so how does secondary growth work? Now you can see from the diagram, I've got primary xylem, which is that, oh, it's kind of hard to see, but it may be easier here. It's like it might be darker brown in the middle. The secondary xylem is that bright orange. The vascular cambium is the blue and secondary phloem is the yellow. So you can see the secondary phloem actually kind of stays the same. Vascular cambium doesn't change, but what makes the tree bigger is really secondary xylem. And of course the formation of the bark on the outside. Now all of the second, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, <coughs> all of the secondary growth <coughs> 
occurs because of the division of cells in the vascular cambium. That's where all the uh, secondary xylem and secondary phloem. Because they are separated, like here, basically you have, okay, that's really not clear. Let's make it yellow. So you got your vascular cambium, you've got your phloem on the outside, your xylem on the inside. So you always make secondary xylem towards the inside and you build up secondary xylem the most and phloem towards the outside. Again, you make more secondary xylem than secondary phloem. Wood is made of secondary xylem, like all of it. So think about how a tree starts from like a sapling that has a diameter of like, I don't know, a couple of centimeters and it ends up becoming maybe like a giant sequoia redwood tree, which is like 200 meters tall and it's like five meters in diameter. That's all secondary xylem. Again, secondary phloem, yeah, secondary phloem basically stays the same. So you can see here uh, between, between this picture and that picture, you can obviously see the formation of the bark. This is going to be the sapling. It's still growing and expanding. It's only until you see this thick bark forming, but you see it's not really that different, the thickness of it. And phloem, living phloem is part of the bark. The majority of the thickness is added by xylem here in the middle. And don't forget xylem is dead at maturity. It's very important for the transportation of water. So the older parts of xylem are eventually going to stop transporting water. And this is going to be towards the center of the tree trunk, the stem of the tree. And it often becomes darker because uh, resin or sap, other secondary compounds that are made by other xylem cells start to build up and you get what's called heartwood. Heartwood is this area here, the darker center in the middle of the tree. Those, are, that those areas represent xylem that is no longer transporting water because they're basically, think of like, um, I can't think of an analogy, basically like because trees usually contain sap or resin, um, like maple syrup comes from the maple tree, you've got amber, uh, even rubber trees, right? Do they produce rubber? This, this is going to be building up on, on the inside of that. And so it ends up getting clogged up with that sap or that resin, that rubber. And the only parts that are still transporting the water are the lighter areas on the outside. Those lighter areas is called sapwood. In large diameter trees, the heartwood is going to get wider and sapwood stays the same. So again, we've got a cross section of a gymnosperm or dicot. The phloem, here's the living phloem that's in yellow. You can see the vascular cambium in green. We've got the sapwood, which is the still transporting part of xylem. The heartwood in the middle, which is just literally there for support. Vascular cambium, then you've got the living phloem. Then you've got the cork cambium and cork. The living phloem, the cork cambium, and the cork together are what make up bark. And that's the outer uh, protective uh, covering. Now, cork cells are dead at maturity, so they cannot elongate. But as the tree continues to widen, the cork will crack as the stem widens. And that's why bark has this rough um, appearance on the outside because it cracks as the tree trunk expands. Now, I'm sure at least some of you have heard the story of how you can tell how old a tree is by counting the rings in the wood, and this is true, because during the spring, actually, let me put a little asterisk there. It is true for trees that grow in what's called temperate, oops, can't draw the laser, temperate 
climates um, because we have spring wood and summer wood and in temperate climates, meaning that there are four seasons, you definitely have uh, times of the year like the spring where there's a lot of rain. So the xylem tissue that grows in the spring is going to be very thin walled with very large vacuoles to absorb all that water. And during the summer, when it's drier, the vascular cambium is going to make smaller uh, xylem cells with thicker walls because it is more dry. So you're going to end up with something like this. Either you count the, um, the light rings, which is here in the green dot. So you either count the light rings, which is the spring wood, or you count the dark rings, which is this white here. This is the summer wood. So when you count the rings, basically you're counting from one summer to the next summer, that's one year. You don't count every other ring. You're counting the dark rings or the light rings. Usually people count the dark rings because they look more like rings. So you can count to approximate the age of a tree. That's called the annual ring. Again, in, uh, in tropical environments like in Thailand, they're a little bit harder to discern because you don't have these um, really distinct hot and dry uh, seasons versus like cooler and wetter seasons. All right, because the environment's basically the same year round, you get about the same amount of sun, blah, blah. Okay, now, uh, hold on a second. Wait, why are you doing that? Oh, because I'm on the wrong thing. I'm trying to see how much more do I want to stop there or? No, I don't have that much to go through, okay. The last thing is just talking about um, the functions of the stem. And this is going to uh, include how water is transported and how food is transported. There's two models or two theories to describe each. So the main functions of a stem is transport, obviously food and water, and also to store nutrients and water, also to support the, uh, the leaves, because that's obviously where leaves come from, or the, yeah, the stem. So first thing we're gonna look at is the transport of food. Now, food is transported through phloem. I did mention, and just to remind you, that phloem is living and it comes with a companion cell. Oops. No, no. Oh, why, why'd you do that? Bluetooth. Okay, we, have, we come with a companion cell. And there's a reason why we have a companion cell. So carbohydrates are going to move. Remember I said that carbohydrates or food can move anywhere within phloem in any direction. It really depends on if it's moving from where they're made in the leaves or if it's maybe during the winter time and the leaves aren't doing photosynthesis, so the food has to move from where it's stored, maybe in the roots, to other parts of the plant. So we call where the, uh, where the carbohydrates come from, we call that the source. And the place where they're going to travel to, to be used, is called the sink, okay? And this is going to involve osmosis as well. So I hope you remember what osmosis is, the movement of water. Okay. So this whole process is called translocation. Um, it's very different from transpiration, which is how water is moved through the plant. Translocation, the movement of carbohydrates through the plant. Again, carbohydrates can be made in photosynthetic cells or stored. That should be stored, not stores. Um, and we use what's called the pressure flow hypothesis to explain how carbohydrates move through the sieve tubes of uh, phloem. Now, the reason why phloem is living, the reason why it needs companion cell is because of this, actively transported. Now, if you remember all the way back to chapter five, when I talked about osmosis, passive transport, active transport, Osmosis is, tr is passive transport. It happens by itself without energy. But in plants, carbohydrates are gonna move from the source to the sink through active transport, which requires energy 
and you can't get energy from dead cells. So this is why companion cells are used. Okay, so what basically happens? You have the source cell. Let's say this is the leaf, right? Here's the chloroplasts. This is where the glucose or the sucrose is made. They're going to be actively transported from the companion cell into the top of the sieve tube. Now, when you move sugar from the companion cell into phloem here, you're going to increase the concentration of solute, which means, because your xylem is right next to it, which means you have a lower concentration of water here, which means water is going to move into the sieve tube through osmosis. Okay, again, when you move sucrose into the sieve tube, that means that the concentration of solutes is increased, which automatically means the concentration of water is decreased. That is going to cause water to move into the top of the sieve tube by osmosis. This is the pressure part of the pressure flow hypothesis, okay? So you've got sugar moving into the sieve tube and water moving into the sieve tube. That's a whole lot of molecules moving into the sieve tube. So you're creating a lot of pressure here at the top of the tube. Now, at the other end of the tube, you're going to actively transport carbohydrates out of the sieve tube into the companion cell through to the sink. Now, because of that, you're decreasing the concentration of solutes here, which means your concentration of water has increased, which causes water to move back into the xylem through osmosis. This creates a low pressure at the bottom. You've got high pressure at the top. So guess what happens to the carbohydrates? They flow from the source to the sink. So that's why it's called pressure flow. Okay, again, sugar deposited into the xyl, uh, sorry, sugar deposited into the phloem that reduces the concentration of water here. So water moves in by osmosis, you create a high pressure at the top. The opposite happens at the sink. You transport sucrose out, probably shouldn't be using blue, but anyway, you actively transport sugar out, which means water moves back into xylem. You've got low pressure here at the bottom, high pressure, low pressure, the sugar flows from the source to the sink. That's the pressure flow hypothesis. The vascular system of plants has two transport tissues called xylem and phloem. Xylem transports water and minerals, while phloem transports a variety of dissolved substances, including sugars and amino acids, throughout the plant. Water in the xylem always moves up in the direction from the roots to the leaves. At the leaves, water evaporates. This evaporation, called transpiration, creates tension at the top of the water column in the xylem and causes water to be drawn upward from the roots. Unlike in the xylem, the solution in the phloem can flow up or down the plant. The direction depends on the concentration of solutes in the phloem. A model, called the pressure flow model, describes how sucrose concentrations determine the direction of the flow. Two types of cells, source cells and sink cells, play roles in the transport of solutions in the phloem. Source cells produce sucrose and load it into the phloem. Source cells are typically photosynthetic leaf cells, but they can also be other cell types. For example, root cells with large stores of carbohydrates can act as source cells by releasing these carbohydrates into the phloem. Sink cells are any cells that unload sucrose from the phloem. Sink cells are found throughout the plant, but are abundant in roots or developing fruits and shoot tips. Sink cells typically cannot meet their own needs for carbohydrates and must import them from the phloem. The fluid begins to flow when source cells pump sucrose into the phloem. As the concentration of sucrose in the phloem increases, water enters the sieve tubes by osmosis.
the water enters from any surrounding tissues, such as the xylem, that have lower solute concentrations than the phloem. As water flows into the sieve tubes, the turgor pressure within the sieve tubes increases. This pressure forces the sugar solution through the sieve tubes to regions of lower pressure. The solution passes by sink cells, and these cells take up sucrose. As the sucrose concentration decreases, water flows by osmosis out of the phloem to regions of higher solute concentrations. The loss of water, in turn, decreases the pressure in the phloem and pulls fluid from other, higher pressure regions of the phloem. Okay, so that's the pressure flow hypothesis of the transport of food. The last thing is a transport of water. Water and minerals are transported through xylem through one, or sorry, uh, in one direction only. So the, uh, what do you call that? Um, the model that's used to describe how water moves through is called the cohesion tension theory. And basically, if you think of a tree, right, um, in the bottom of the leaves, remember we have the stomata. These are the holes where uh, water evaporates out, but it's also um, the adaptation from the development of the cuticle, going back to the beginning of um, the whole plant unit. When plants made the transition from an aquatic environment to a terrestrial environment, they developed a cuticle. This is really important to prevent desiccation or drying out from lack of water. Um, but the cuticle, because it's, it's a waxy substance, it also prevents gas exchange. So on the bottom side of leaves, you have stomata, these holes that open up during the day to allow carbon dioxide in, but it also allows oxygen to go out and it also has water evaporate out through the leaves. Now, understanding that from the time that the plant came out of the seed, you have these not so nicely drawn xylem tubes going all the way from the roots all the way up to the leaves. And they have been completely filled with water since day one. The second it came out of the seed and the primary root exited the seed and started absorbing water. If water is evaporating out, think of them as like really long, tiny, tiny little narrow straws. And at the top of the straw, you have like a, a, a suction kind of, uh, uh, what do you call that? like a suction type of thing, like water evaporating, right? If you're thinking of like us sucking on a straw, that's like a really small version of what happens for water. So when you suck on a straw, the suction that you're using with your mouth is putting a tension on the column of water inside that straw. So have you ever thought about like, if you're drinking a glass of water through a straw and you start sucking the water up, like why doesn't the water column just break? in the middle, like if it's all this tension on the column of water, why doesn't the column of water just snap in half? That's the cohesion part. This is why in grade 10, you learn about cohesion. Cohesion meaning to stick, stick together, right? Co's together, cohesion means to stick. Because water is a polar molecule, they really like each other. And so they don't want to pull apart. They don't want to snap. So as water is evaporating out from the leaves, it's, it's putting this in, intense tension on all of the column of water going through the entire tree. And because of cohesion, that column of water does not snap and it pulls the entire column of water up through the tree and then more water enters through the roots. That's basically the cohesion tension theory. It all occurs because of transpiration that's a result of plants needing carbon dioxide through their, sto their stomata. So it's the cohesion tension theory. The water is pulled up the entire column of uh, xylem by cohesion. This is why the xylem cells have to be dead at maturity because if the xylem cells are alive at all, they might absorb some of the water and break that cohesion. As the water evaporates out of the stomata, the water column experiences a great deal of tension 
but it does not break because of cohesion and also adhesion with the xylem walls. And so the only possible direction is up. It's exactly the same theory behind why when we use a straw, the water goes up the straw because you apply a vacuum at the top and the water column has two options. It either breaks or it goes up. And so because of cohesion and adhesion, it doesn't break. It just goes up. Sometimes the simplest questions have the most. Okay, I am not going to play that because that's longer than the rest of the period. I will show this tomorrow though because it's a really cool video on really tall trees. Um, because it turns out, well, you know what? I'll explain it tomorrow. It'd just be much easier. Um, okay, hold on, let me stop.